Okay, so thank you everybody for coming today. Um, I'm just going to start diving in here. So I want to start off with this quote that a graphic designer friend of mine shared with me. Just have nothing in your design that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. Um, so this topic of design being useful, both useful and beautiful, um, both being functional and attractive to look at, is a theme that we're going to be revisiting often throughout this presentation. So I want to put that in your heads right now. Just one or the other is not enough. You need both. So, in thinking of that, I want to go back and talk about what is a content management system. So, a little bit of background. I can't get into all the details of technically how a website works um, and how HTML and CSS works. Um, but basically, the idea is that HTML is a special language that tells a browser, like Internet Explorer or Firefox, how to show a web page. Um, and because it's a special language, to be able to write in HTML, you need to understand some technical knowledge. And not everyone wants to be able to do that. So basically, a content management is the solution to that problem. And the short story of what it means for you as a non-techie is that it means that you can edit the content on your website without having to know the technical details. It basically separates the technical details. You don't need to pay attention to that. Instead, you can just focus on updating content, adding pages, maybe changing the look and feel, doing some basic changes to that. So I'm going to actually just show you a little quick demo for those of you who haven't seen a content management system before. Um, this is what you should be seeing now, uh, or in a second when it refreshes, is actually the TechSoup Canada website. Uh, and we, our website is built in a content management system called Drupal, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, and this is a blog post that I wrote. I write my Friday feed every week, just summing up some, uh, some great resources and blog posts I've found on the web. And as you can see, because I'm logged in, I have this extra panel that you wouldn't see normally, this extra set of tabs. Um, you won't see this if you're logged out. It's only because I'm logged in and I'm an administrator that I can see this. And one of the tabs is Edit. So you can see at the bottom of my blog, I have some text here that shouldn't be here. Um, it doesn't really fit in the blog, and I want to take it out. So what I'm going to do is, instead of having to edit the HTML, I'm just going to press the Edit button and give it a second to load. And then it's going to show me a bunch of fields. Now, it's a bit complicated. Fortunately, I don't have to deal with all of them. But it will allow me to basically change my page, and it's almost like editing a document in Word. It's not like having to understand a technical language. So here you go. Here you can see it's different fields. And the most important one is this box here where I can edit my page content. So you can see I've got bold, italics, underline, etc., just like being in Word or um, any other program like that. And if I scroll down, I'll find this text that should not be in here. So I'll just delete this. Um, as you can see, I could also insert a picture. I could make a link. I could do various other things. I just won't do that now. We'll ignore all those other boxes. And then I'll save the changes that I just made. And it will be updated on the site live in real time. So that's the idea be behind a content management system, if you haven't seen it before. If we look now, um, my text is now gone, that, that, uh, that little piece of text that I have. So that's the idea. It's really simple and easy to update. You don't need to understand the technical side. Um, it's a big advantage for nonprofits. Uh, if your site isn't in a CMS right now, having it in a CMS will empower you to be able to make the changes yourself, and that's a huge advantage. So this is why I wanted to take a moment now to just show that to you. So we're going to get back to our presentation here. And I'll move along with this. One sec, let me just minimize that. Okay. So the one other point before I dive into the website design process that I want to emphasize is that take the time to make sure you know what your mission is, what your organization really does. Um, and I know, I'm, like, I'm sure you have your mission stay memorized, um, but it's a little bit more than that. It's understanding what's really at the heart of what your organization is um, in plain language that people talk about, not necessarily in the 
jargon that you tend to use uh, because you're familiar with your topic. And the reason this is important, it's not really about websites, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, but the reason this is important is because your website is a communications tool. And if you can't communicate clearly about what your mission is, what your organization does to people on, in writing or when you're talking to them, then you're also not going to be able to communicate through your website. Um, it's not going to be magically made clear as soon as you put things in a website. So having the ability to communicate clearly what it is that you do will also translate um, to having a clear, simple, and focused website, which is what your goal is. So when you think of the website design process, this is probably what you think of, I'm guessing. You think we build the site, we have to design it, we have to work on um, putting it together, and then we launch it. And then, yes, we have a website. Fantastic. Um, now, this is great, but in my opinion, there's a couple of things missing from this, this diagram. So this is what I think it should really look like. It's actually four different steps. Now, of course, these steps aren't always going to happen strictly in this order. Uh, sometimes you'll go back and do steps again, but these are the general four pieces that are important to think about. So we have two new ones here you've noticed. The first one is identify needs. The reason this is important, um, you can't just jump into building or designing your site. Um, you need to do this needs identification step first. Um, the reason is if you don't know what you want, who knows what you're going to get, but it's probably not going to be what you need. Um, I can almost guarantee you that. Uh, as an example of this, uh, this is something that uh, one of the consultants we we talked to shared with me. Um, on the left side, these are both that, these are both sets of requirements that a nonprofit provided him for what they wanted on their website. The one on the left side, all they gave him was a list of eight page titles that they wanted on their site. That was it. No guidance of what. Um, what they wanted it to look like, who their target audience was, um, nothing, just a list of eight titles. And he asked them for more information, they didn't provide it. Basically, if you do that, if that's what you tell your consultant, what you're doing is you're putting it in their hands and you're saying, make whatever the heck you want. Who knows? Like your consultant could have no understanding of your mission, they could have no understanding of what you do. They could make a site that's totally inappropriate for you um, through no fault of their own, just because you didn't, you didn't tell them what it was that you really wanted. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, you've got someone that's actually taken the time to think through what they want. They've provided clear and detailed directions to their consultant, um, and they're going to get a site that actually matches what their needs are because they took the time to think it through. Now, don't get caught up on the length of that specific uh, set of instructions. That's not, my, that's not important. That's not what the point is. It will depend on how complex your site is. The point is taking time to think through their needs. So we're going to talk a bit more about that. The other piece that's important is the maintenance step. Um, once you launch your website, it's not done. Um, there's ongoing maintenance that has to be done, both in terms of the, the system that you're using will need to continue to be updated, and in terms for you, just keeping the content up to date, keeping your site alive, something that people want to come back to repeatedly. So you're not, you're not totally done once your site launches. You're not totally off the hook. So this is overall uh, the design process. This is overall what to expect when you're building a new website, and this is what we're going to dig into a little bit during the rest of this presentation. So I want to start off, and I'm going to spend quite a chunk of time on this because I think it's really important, as I've mentioned. What does it mean to identify your needs? Uh, what exactly should you be thinking about to make sure that you get a site that is what you want? So to start off, the two of the first, the most important questions you should be asking are who will visit your website and why? What do they want to do while they're on your website? So are you targeting potential donors? Are you putting more of a focus on volunteers? Is this for your board? Is it, do you want people to um, be advocates for the causes that are important to you? Uh, whatever it is, do you want people to adopt animals? I mean, you need to think about what is it that people want to do on your website? Why are they going there? Um, and, in, and then target it towards them. So I want to illustrate this by showing to you two different sites that I really like. Uh, the first one is really well, they really well thought through that, uh, who is this website for? 
So this is the website for Gateway to the Arts. And you can see here on the left they have three tabs for students, for educators, and for artists. So they have thought through what they want. They have thought through who would be using this site. They've broken it down into three main categories and then they provided clear tabs to get those people easy access to the information that they need. So this is exactly a good example of what you should be doing. When I come to the site, if I'm a student, if I'm an educator, if I'm an artist, I know exactly where to go. It's really clear. No confusion. Another great example uh, from Canada is the Wood Green Community Centre. Um, and here again, it's a little more focused. Instead of who you are, it's focused around what you're trying to do. So at the top, we have Get Help, Give Now, so donating, and volunteering. So these are the three main actions that they want you to be taking on their site. And they've, in the design, they've really called that, called that out. They've really um, made it clear what the different options are. So that's the kind of thing you want to be thinking about. You want your site to do that too. Um, you don't want your site to be vague, to um, just confuse people. And, but how do you get there? Um, how do you know? And so what my tip would be is find three sites that you love. Just browse around other websites, um, in particular nonprofit websites, and in particular the websites of people who do similar work to you um, and those who have a bigger budget and can do whatever they want. Uh, and look at what it is that they do and what is it that they do well. Um, and that will give you ideas for what you would like on your site. And at these very early stages, it's important to, to dream big. Um, you don't want to get overboard, but also if you're not a technical person, you don't really know what's possible. Some things that might seem really hard are actually really easy from a technical perspective and vice versa. So focus on what it is that you want. And then later on, once you're talking with the techie person, you can narrow it down and figure out how to actually make that happen. Is it realistic? What's it going to cost, et cetera? So start by making, start by having a clear vision. A couple of other points that I want to briefly mention, um, not get into because they're pretty complex. Uh, the first one is whether your website will integrate with other systems. Do you have an online community? Do you have a, co a constituent relationship management system or a database that you want to be integrated with? That will sometimes affect your choice of website, um, what platform you use, how much time you need to put into developing it, etc. Uh, the second piece is, do you want a mobile version of your website? Um, and this may be something you just think off the bat, no, oh my gosh, freaking out, way too much work, um, couldn't handle that. So it is tough. I mean, I certainly, we at TechSoup don't yet have a mobile version of our website, so I do sympathize. Um, on the other hand, use of mobile websites really is growing. You, what you can do to get a feel for whether people are coming to your website on their mobile devices is to look at your Google Analytics, if you have it, and if you don't have it, I'll explain later why you need it. Um, look at who's coming, how many visits are you getting from mobile devices. Should give you a ballpark for whether this is something you need to be considering or not. Um, but it really is growing. I mean, I know it's hard to understand. If you don't have a smartphone yourself, you think, why are people coming to my website on a mobile device? I don't get it. No one's doing it. It's not important. Um, and it does depend on who your constituents are. But certainly, once you have one, you'll realize how annoying it is to work with websites that are not optimized for mobile devices. And sometimes it's not too hard. So just another thing to keep in mind, this is an example that Oxfam have done. Obviously, they have lots of money to do things like this. Um, but it's just, this is a good stage to be thinking about it. And sometimes it's really not that hard. So be aware that this is an option. Uh, so now, I thought a little bit about what your needs are. You also want to think about what it is you already have, because you're not starting from absolute scratch, unless you're maybe starting your organization, a very new organization. So you're almost probably going to have some staff with some kind of relevant skills. Maybe some of your staff know HTML or CSS. Maybe they're familiar with one of these content management systems. Maybe they have some skills in graphic design. Maybe they're great at writing clear and simple text uh, that you can use on your website. All of those and more are skills that you're going to be needing in your website design process. So be aware of that and definitely be taking advantage of their skills. And similarly, if your volunteers have these skills, you'll also want to make use of them. If you already have branding materials, so if you have a logo, if you have print materials, you may want your website to look similar to that. Or you may be redesigning your look altogether. 
um, and you'll want that to match. So again, it's something to think about, especially when you're working with a graphic designer. They'll be asking for that. And if you have a current website, you'll want to look at your analytics. Um, again, I'm going to come back to this a few times. Having Google Analytics or a similar tool on your website will tell you what pages people are visiting, how often are they visiting, how many visits are you getting, um, how long are they staying on your site, all this important piece of information that will tell you uh, what is useful, what is not useful. If there's a page that nobody is ever visiting, maybe you can ask why. Is it not being highlighted enough? Is it just not needed? Um, is it for a very specific purpose? It'll just give you so much insight into how people are using your website. And I'll show you a little demo of that later. Even if you don't have analytics, you probably have some kind of online donations on your site. So you can see things like how much money people are donating through your site, and that can help you set some goals for your new website. Budget. Budget's always a fun topic with nonprofits because no one ever has any. But um, first of all, the first point I want to say is that budget is both money and time. Um, it's a bit of a trade-off because you could choose to save money on consultants by having your staff do work, uh, but then maybe your staff are taking away time from time away from programs, and you'd be better off to have your staff spend that time on programs and instead hire someone externally to do the work. So it's a trade-off you have to be aware of. Nothing comes for free, not even staff time, except for maybe volunteer time. But I would argue that doesn't even come for free. Um, so think about what your trade-offs are. I also put down the 60% guideline. This is something that one of my friends who's a designer told me about. This was her recommendation to nonprofits. It's not a hard and fast rule. What she suggested is she said, um, say your budget for your website is $1,000, which isn't great, but it's a nice round number, so let's use that. If you have a $1,000 budget, tell your consultant that your budget is $600, or 60% of your total budget. Because the fact is, stuff comes up. Um, it's you'll just want money for contingency. You'll want stuff if, um, if your project runs over time, or if you need more features than you previously realized, or just whatever may be, unexpected things may come up. Give yourself a good chunk of contingency so you don't get near the end of your website, run out of money, and then be stuck because you don't have something that is ready to launch yet. You have something that's only partly done, and you can't use it. So. That's, uh, that's something you want to take into consideration. So once you've, the next step is also to think a little bit ahead into the future. Uh, it's impossible to, of course, to predict exactly what you're going to need. But maybe you are planning to launch a new program in the next year or so. Or maybe you want to build an online community, but you don't want to do that right away. Um, you're going to want to do that next year. Whatever it is, um, or maybe you're launching a capital campaign that's starting in six months from now, and that's going to affect how your website will look, or you're going to build a new website for that, and you want it to be integrated. Um, look a little bit down the road. Try to think about what your needs are going to be, how you're going to need to grow in this website, because um, you want to give yourself that room to grow. If you pick a platform that only has exactly the features you need right now and then you want something new and it's not there, you're going to be stuck. You're going to have to start from ground zero again. You're going to have to um, start from scratch. So think a little bit ahead. What are your needs going to be a little bit down the road? Don't, think too, don't, don't go beyond two years. You can't predict what you're going to be doing more than two years from now and you can't predict what the technology is going to be more than two years from now. So between now and two years is a good ballpark. At this point, you've also spent some time thinking about what you want to do. You can narrow down your goals to the two to three main goals or purposes of your site. And that might feel really limited. Um, but again, coming back to my earlier point, if your site's purpose is not clear and simple, if you don't have that nice artists, educators, students look to it, it will just be cluttered. No one will be able to find what they want. So better that there's a few things that it's really easy to do um, and stuff is organized and grouped well then if it's just all over the place, uh, really confusing and hard to understand, then nobody gets what they need out of your website. Now, I want to talk a little bit about choosing a consultant. This is not something everyone's going to do. You might already have a consultant that you love, so this might not be relevant for you. Or you might have a teeny tiny project you don't need a consultant for. Or you might have the expertise already in-house. So again, this isn't relevant. 
But for many people, you will need to think about hiring a consultant because you just don't have the skills to do it yourself. Uh, and it's really important to pick someone that has the right skills and will be a good partner for your organization. You need to think about it a little bit like hiring a staff. I think some people approach hiring a consultant like, okay, who's the cheapest? And I'll pick them without thinking about, you know, are they good to work with? Are they, have they done good work in the past? Do they understand my mission? Um, but you would never hire a staff like that. When you'd hire a staff, you would take the time to figure out, do they have the right skills to do this job? Do, are they passionate about our mission? Are they going to fit in well with the team? Um, are they right personality for this organization? That's how you'd think about hiring a staff. And I want you to think about choosing a consultant in the same way. Uh, the two key skills that you'll be looking for in consultants uh, from a technical perspective are design skills and the geek skills, the technical side. You need both. So you can hire one person who has both. You can hire two people that each have one of those skills. It's okay as long as they're both covered. Having only one or the other is very bad. I'll get back to that later. Um, so you need someone who can make things pretty and you need someone who can make things work. In short, um, how do you find these people? I don't have any magic bullet for you. Unfortunately, we don't have a great directory of this right now. Um, so my recommendation would be to ask your friends and colleagues who work for similar types of organizations, similar sizes of organizations, who they have. Did they like them? Did that person listen to them? Did that person understand what they wanted? Or did that person just um, kind of like whip something off for them that didn't meet their needs and they were upset afterwards or they didn't stick around in the long run? It can be really tempting to, especially when you're on a low budget, to get a volunteer to do your website and in particular say, okay, well our board's chair's nephew's brother's husband's son, that probably didn't make sense, but anyway, can do websites. Why doesn't he build us a website? He's willing to do it for free. Um, and that's really tempting. Uh, and I don't want to say that's never the right approach, but I really, really would caution against that. And the reason is because of this last point. That person is not going to be around in the long term. They might not even stick around long enough to actually finish your website. Um, and having a good website and a good partner that you can rely on and who can help answer questions, who can help you when things go wrong, who can help you when you want to make the next update to your site, that's worth taking the time to figure out. Having a volunteer who will disappear and leave you with a site that you don't know how to use that maybe doesn't meet your needs, um, you're just going to have to start from scratch again six months from now. And that is just a waste of your time. You don't want to be doing that. So even though it seems tempting, it seems like a good deal in the short term, take the long term view. Uh, find someone who will actually meet your needs. And it's, sorry, I skipped that point. Avoid custom solutions. If someone has their own custom CMS, I'm kind of wary of that. There's a lot of other good options out there that I'll talk about in a minute. You can ask me about that later if you want to hear more about that point. So and the last thing I want to talk about in this section, actually second last, is roles and responsibilities. So this is things like who's going to be managing the project, who's going to be arranging meetings, making sure things move along, um, all that type of stuff. And this is something you want to set up front and make sure that everyone's on the same page, everyone has the same expectations. Uh, and to illustrate why this is important, I'm just going to tell you a brief story of the time that I worked for a for-profit company. It was a small for-profit company that was in the process of redesigning their website. And they had hired an outside marketing firm to do their website redesign for them. But they skipped this part. They didn't talk about roles and responsibilities. And they didn't set the expectations up front. So when I got there, what I had found that happened is that Basically, nobody was owning the project. Each party expected each other to own the project. So the company I was working for thought, why isn't the marketing firm we hired? Well, we hired them. So why aren't they, why aren't they managing us? Why aren't they telling us, we need you to review this? Why aren't they asking us for our feedback on things? Um, meanwhile, the marketing firm was saying, well, the company that hired us, they're responsible for making sure that this project moves along. Why aren't they getting in contact with us? So each side was just kind of sitting there wondering why the other person wasn't doing anything. And in short, nothing was happening. There was a lot of miscommunication. Uh, it led to a lot of arguments over the budget because then by the time things actually started happening, 
the original requirements weren't correct anymore, things needed to be changed, um, there's just a lot of confusion and um, stress around the whole situation and it could have been avoided by having some discussion of it up front. In the end, what had to happen was that someone from the company that I worked for had to take over managing the website to actually make sure it was moving along and got completed in time. So some, you, you can't just expect that the website's going to happen and don't just assume that your contractor or consultant is going to manage it for you. Um, if you want them to do that, you need to let them know or you need to take it on yourself. I quickly want to just say something about timeline. Uh, if you have your annual report being released in three weeks and you would love to have a website up by then and you haven't started anything yet, I, it probably won't happen. So don't tie your website to some fixed date that's not realistic and hasn't been well thought through. Um, if you haven't worked on a website before, um, it is possible to do quickly, but you want to take the time to think it through um, and you don't necessarily know how long things will take. As I said before, some technically some hard things are easy, some easy things are hard. Um, sit down with your consultant, make a plan that's realistic. Don't try to tie it to some unrealistic expectation um, that will just cause stress for the team when you can't reach it. So, and I actually just got a question on uh, WordPress. I'm actually going to get into that in a second. So now what I'm going to talk about, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talking about the process. Okay, we know what we want. We're ready to start um, choosing the actual content management system we're going to use. And then we're ready to start designing and building our website. So first time, as I said, I'm going to talk about different content management system options. So if you're already a CMS Pro, this stuff will be reviewed for you. Um, and then later I'll jump back into some other stuff, so you'll want to come back for that. Um, and then, as I said, I'll talk more about things like design, uh, search engine optimization, and Google Analytics. And this, this next little section I'd like to give credit to Julian Eaglestaff from Freeform Solutions, who came up with this, and I just stole it from him with his permission. So when it comes to content management systems, there's three main like groups of options, different three main paths that you can go down, let's put it that way. Um, there's the commercial and proprietary option, open source, or a completely custom solution. And I'm going to talk briefly about each one. So a commercial proprietary solution is like renting an apartment. Basically, someone's already built something for you. You go rent your apartment, you pay a monthly fee, you can make some changes, like you can paint the walls, but you can't put an extension on the apartment, you can't add a patio if there isn't one there already. You're kind of limited by what you can do, and a commercial proprietary constant management system is like that. Um, they're usually really well built, it can be really easy to use, um, sometimes more so than um, other, the other options. Um, so if what you want is within the parameters of what's there, uh, it can be great, but there's not room to expand. If you want to do new things, uh, you can't, basically. You're limited by what's there already, by what the, the company making the CMS has decided to do. So that's, that's one option. And an example is Squarespace. Um, this is what it looks like. Other examples are Weebly, Wix, etc. Um, Basically, most content management systems that aren't open source would fall into this category. The second option is, as I mentioned, open source. And this is pretty much like buying a fixer-upper. And my friend who uses this analogy actually develops and is very passionate about open source. So um, it's, it's the truth. Um, open source is great, but it does require a little bit of tender loving care to make it work for you. On the plus side, pretty much the sky's the limit. If you want to add an extension to this house, go for it if you've got the resources. Um, you're pretty much limited by what you have the resources to do, not by the, not by the system itself. So there's a lot of possibilities. As an illustration, um, like Drupal, for, uh, sorry, let's say WordPress, which I'll talk about in a second, is pretty easy when you get started up. Uh, like it will, when you first install it, it looks like a website. When you first install Drupal, this is what it looks like. This does not look like a website. This looks like some weird page that's giving you a bunch of instructions. So this needs a bit of work, right? Like you can't just go publish this website right away. So this is kind of 
how it is with open source is that it needs a little bit of work before it's ready to use. But it's still a really good option. I mean, it's kind of, in my opinion, the top option for nonprofits, and I'll go into some of the details in a second. Your last option is to build a custom system, whether content management system or not. You're starting from ground up, um, and really what this is like is it's kind of like Survivor Man. You know, you're going out into the forest and you're building your own house, and you can build whatever you want, but you need to have the resources and work to do it. So this is not going to be realistic for most people. Um, it's just out of the range of most nonprofits' ability to do because it's so much work. Now, of course, if none of those options seem popular, this is probably what everybody really wants. You want a nice, gorgeous house, something beautiful. Um, and it is possible. If It's probably too much to ask. If you have a custom system, or sorry, a proprietary system, you probably can't get here because it's too fancy. But if you really put the work into your fixer-upper open source system, you could get here. And if you built it from scratch, you could get here if you invested a huge amount of resources. So that's why I feel that op open source is often a good balance for nonprofits because it gives you the flexibility to do new things, but it also provides you a place to start from that's good. Um, and a lot of nonprofits do use open source systems, but I, I want you to know about all the different options. Um, if you have a simple thing that you need, a commercial or proprietary system may be the right thing for you. Briefly on three of the main, most popular open source CMS systems. All three of these systems I'm going to talk about, which is WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal. All three of these systems have a very strong developer community behind them. They have a lot of people using them. They're very popular. So you don't need to worry that um, they're going to go, they're going to go away overnight or anything like that. Um, these will be around at least for the next few years and will have really solid support. The first one, and I'm going to talk about them from sort of simplest and easiest to most complex. The simplest and easiest one is WordPress. It was originally started as a blogging platform, which is why it's called WordPress. But now you can use it to make websites. Uh, and when you start it up initially, it will look like a blog, but you can just disable the blogging functionality and it will look like a normal website for you. Um, it's, it's really good, as I mentioned before, in the sense that it's just up and running a lot faster than the other systems. Um, it's pretty easy to get it started. And, but it's not as good for that more complex. Like if you need to have an online community on your site, you need to have people logging in. WordPress is not going to do it for you. It's way too simple. For your basic website, with a blog, with other types of content being updated, um, it's going to be great. So I mean, talk to a developer or read some more detailed comparisons if you need to know more. But for simple WordPress, for simple websites, sorry, I highly recommend WordPress. The one other thing I want to note is that all three of these things I'm going to talk about have the idea of modules, and they're all called something different. It's a little confusing. WordPress, they're called plugins. But the basic idea is that WordPress comes with a set of functionality. That's like that fixer upper house you bought. But you can buy pre-made things to attach to it, so like a pre-made porch. That's a module. So you get your porch, you attach it to your house. You don't have to build that porch yourself because someone already built it for you. So a website example might be a photo gallery. WordPress by default does not have a photo gallery, but someone's already built the possibility to have a photo gallery on a WordPress site. So if you install the photo gallery plugin, then you instantly, without having to develop anything, suddenly have the ability to have a photo gallery on your site. So all three systems have this uh, idea of modules, and it's a really great way of just getting lots of new functionality without having to pay someone to develop it. The second CMS I'm going to talk about is Joomla. So Joomla is sort of the in-between uh, between WordPress and Drupal. It's pretty easy to use, not as simple as WordPress, though. And it's designed for standard public-facing websites. So if I compare WordPress and Joomla, I said WordPress by default is a blog, but you can turn it into a website by disabling the blog options. Joomla is the opposite. It's by default a website, but you can turn it into a blog by enabling the blog functionality. So it's just, they're built for slightly different things, but they, they can do, they can probably both do the stuff that you want. Again, it has 
modules, which in this case are called components, that allow you to add on different features. The thing that's a bit different with Joomla is that it has this uh, idea of a commercial culture built into it. So some of, really what that means is some of the components you have to pay for, whereas with WordPress and Drupal, they tend to be free. A really good system, though, very popular. Um, definitely one to look into if you want something a little more complex than what WordPress can offer. The third CMS, and this is the one I mentioned TechSoup Canada uses, is Drupal. And the thing with Drupal is that it's definitely more complex than the other two. Um, I will admit that flat out. Um, so <laughs> you want it, but it's, it has way more capability to do more things than the other systems. So for example, with the TechSoup Canada site, you can log in, first of all. That's a capability that you couldn't do with WordPress. You can also, it's also an e-commerce platform, so you can request products um, through our system, and you couldn't do that. Again, WordPress is not complex enough to be able to handle that. So if you need more complex functionality, like an online community, like e-commerce, then you'll probably want to go with Drupal. And again, like, uh, like the others, it has modules. The modules are a little bit more complicated. You'll want a developer who's familiar with Drupal to help you out with it, for sure, uh, because it is more complex and techy. So I'm going to move on from talking about website uh, CMS options, and I'll come back to that in the questions if people have questions. But I want there's a few other things I want to make sure I cover, because I know we're running short on time. I want to briefly come back to this idea again. Your website needs to be beautiful and useful. Just one or the other doesn't work. So here's an example of a website that is really neither beautiful nor useful. <laughs> Um, these people are great, don't get me wrong, it's nothing personal about them. They know that their site is a problem. Um, but So for example, we have here on the left side a user login section. Now, if you actually talk to these people, nobody ever logs in and nobody really knows why anyone would want to log in. This site was built by a geek, not there was no designer involved. So remember when I said you need someone who's both a geek and a designer? Um, this is why, because otherwise you end up with the site with functionality, like the geek person probably thought it was really cool. They were doing this nonprofit a favor by having them, giving them the ability to let people log into their site. But if nobody uses that login, there's no point to it. It shouldn't be there. It's overly complex when it doesn't need to be. So you want to make sure what you need. You want to make sure you have something that's both attractive and usable. On the other hand, you can, go, you can go the other way. And this is an example of a site that's beautiful but is not useful. This was built for a specific capital campaign, and I won't mention which organization it was. They wanted to buy a building, and they built this gorgeous site in Flash uh, to, to raise money for their campaign, and they used it on the launch of their capital campaign, this big event. And it was great for the launch because it was pretty, people could look at it, you can hover over those little windows there, and uh, little information will pop up about what's going to happen in the building. Very pretty. But there's no long-term plan with this site. It's not that useful because there's no place to provide updates. And a capital campaign is not going to be over in one night. It's going to take years. So you want to be able to update people on what's going on with the capital campaign. What progress are you making? This site has no place to do that. Um, as well, there's a few other issues with it. For example, a lot of the targets of people they were fundraising from in this case were people that would go to the site on a mobile device and Flash sites don't really work that well on a mobile device, and mouse overs are not possible on a mobile device. So those little windows there doesn't work on a mobile device. You wouldn't be able to see the information. And the other thing is that it doesn't have Google Analytics. As I said, Google Analytics is awesome. You really, really want to have it. So this is a site that's beautiful but not useful. As an example, there is hope. I'll show you an example that I think does um, does do both. And it's this one here, Safe Place. It's an organization that is working towards ending sexual and domestic violence. What I love about their site is that it's both beautiful in the sense that it has a very nice look to it. Um, it's attractive. It's very, you've got people on the front page here, so it's very warm and inviting. It really has the right atmosphere and feel that you want for an organization doing this particular type of work. So it's very visually appealing in that way. But it's also very practical. Right here at the top, uh, you have a hotline. You have here this clear link on the left, I need help. 
So it's really obvious to where you need to go to get the information. Um, you even have this quick escape from site, so it will quickly take you to some other random website if someone walks in and you don't want to see them, you don't want them to see that you've been on this site. So it was, functionality-wise, it was really well thought through who is going to be using the site, what is it that they need when they're on the site, and clearly the number one target audience for the site are women who are suffering from domestic violence and need to get out of it. So very well thought through, this is the kind of thing you want to do with your site, but of course you'll, have, you'll probably have a different target audience. Uh, a quick note uh, from Katya Anderson, who's a marketing blogger, she said, if it doesn't have a pulse, it shouldn't be on your homepage. So you want animals and people. You do not want buildings. Buildings do not engage people, they do not provide warmth. You also don't want software products, which is on the TechSoup Canada homepage. We're a bad example of this. We are working on it. I apologize, by the way, about our website. <laughs> and lastly, um, a quick note, when I say paper prototype, I mean test it out on people. Print out or draw out a copy of what you think you'd want your website to look like, what your idea for design, and then take it to a client, take it to a potential donor, take it to a friend of yours, take it to other staff, and see, can they find the information they're looking for? Um, does it make sense? Do they like it? Um, when you're working on a website project, it's easy to really get focused on what it is that you need out of the website as a staff, as an organization. You sometimes forget that what other people need is different than you. Um, and you don't, you, your website is no longer focused around the people that are coming to visit. So in order to avoid falling into that trap, get other people involved, ask for their feedback. Okay, I can't go into this in depth right now, but search engine optimization basically means that when people search for you on Google, they can find you. Uh, very important, especially say you want, um, say you want people to be fostering animals and you are in Vancouver. You want someone to be able to type in foster animal Vancouver into Google and get to your site. And if they don't, you're, you need some search engine optimization. Um, so what I've done at the bottom here is I've provided a link and it, it's a really good uh, from Wild Apricot's blog. They walk through really clearly why, what this means, why is it important, how do you do it. Um, so I'll leave that with you. I just want to mention it briefly as something to think about. Another thing, I think I've harped on this about a million times so far in this webinar, install Google Analytics. Um, it is amazing. It is free. It takes about two minutes to install. It's a really small change that you can get your developer to do or anyone who knows HTML. And it will be so worth it in the long run. So, and you can see here, this is what the main dashboard for Google Analytics looks like. This is taken from an organization that does uh, advocacy for workers, like just low paid workers. So, what you can see here is all, there's all these like little mini spikes here every week or so, and this is when they send out their weekly newsletter. So this clearly shows you that that weekly newsletter has an effect. Every time they send out an appeal to their supporters, people respond and come to their site, and this is how you can tell that what you're doing is working. And even more, you see these two big spikes here. There's one in May, and there's one later in May. Those two spikes are when that organization got on the front page of the Toronto Star. So people respond. When you get that kind of publicity, people respond, and Google Analytics is how you know. If you didn't have Google Analytics, you have no idea how people are responding. Um, so really worth the time to install. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about the last two sections of the chart, and then I'm going to um, have some time for questions. All I want to say briefly about training is to make sure you have at least two staff trained. The reason it's two is because if one leaves, then you have someone else who knows the skills and can teach other people in the organization. And learn by doing. You, if you watch, <laughs> the developer's idea of training might be to whip through the site, show you how to do some things really quickly, and I guarantee you'll forget how to do it the next day. So, if possible, what you want to ask your developer to do is sit with you while you try to make updates to the site and then help you out when you, when you go wrong, and that way um, you'll learn much better. Also, you want to ask for a training manual because no matter how good your training is, there are things that you're going to forget or you don't have to do frequently. Uh, so you want to make sure that's documented so you can go reference it and not have to call the developer and charge them to, to help you out. Also briefly want to talk about maintenance. There's two main aspects of maintenance. There's 
the back end, like technical maintenance, and there's the content. So the maintenance, the back end maintenance, that's the part that your developer is going to be helping with, and that's the part where you need that ongoing relationship. Because if you are using a system that's open source, it's going to need regular updates and patches to make sure it stays secure, to make sure it has the latest features, etc. So you need to plan a little bit of developer time regularly. It doesn't have to be a lot, but to help out and make sure that you stay up on the ball with those kind of things. You also just want to have your developer available if you have a question, need to make a small change to something that you don't have control over. You want them to be able to be reachable. Um, so having a plan for that in advance is really helpful, and it's really helpful to be able to contact that person. If it's some random volunteer, they're probably gone. You probably can't contact them anymore. On the other side, the content is probably your responsibility. So again, make a plan for this before you launch, because the problem is that content doesn't just appear on your site magically. I mean, if you set up your site, so maybe on the front page there's news or a blog or recent events, Someone has to go in and make sure that stays up to date or your site just gets old, stale, ugly. People come to it and are like, why haven't they updated it in six months? Um, it doesn't look good. So you want to need to think about who will update your website, how often, what content will you use, where does it come from? And it doesn't have to be new content necessarily. It could be stuff you're using somewhere else. But you need to make a plan for it. Um, ideally, what you want to do is tie this to an existing process. So if you're already, say, sending out a newsletter, when you send out your newsletter, maybe you also, at the same time, put an archive of that newsletter on your website. For example, make it as easy as possible for yourself. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of work, but you need to build it into your daily routine to make sure it happens. So I know I've covered a ton of information today, and I'm sorry, I'll take a minute to do questions now, because I know there's been lots of questions that have come in, and if there's more, um, please keep sharing them. I do want to point to you towards a few resources here um, that a couple of these, Chad, one of uh, the consultants we work with, helped me develop. The first one is a logins template. Super helpful for your developer to have, they'll need all your login information, and it's just a good practice to keep anyway. Um, this CMS handout summarizes a lot of what I said, so it's right here. Um, I highly recommend you print this off and like post it on your wall or something because it kind of sums everything up in a good way that's uh, easy to remember. And as I mentioned before, this is based on a Toronto Net Tuesday event. So if you want to see the original presentations, the original video of, uh, of the presenters speaking about these topics, you can get that all on our website. A few more resources, and I'd like to credit the three, develop the three um, consultants, Animatic, Julian, Egglestaff, and Chad Moore, who helped me develop all this content. So I will now have a look at the questions in the question box and um, keep them coming in if you have more questions. Okay, so just going through some of the questions. I unfortunately don't know what platform SafePlace is on. I've uh, never worked with them. So I just saw their website, and I think it's really nice. Um, you'd have to email them and ask them what they used. Um, so I've heard that, yes, there should be no problem with search engines finding sites built with Drupal. Um, 
the issue would actually be, the problem is search engines finding sites that are built on Flash, which is a different technology, and it's used by, I think, Weebly and some of the other um, commercial CMSs. The problem with Flash is that sometimes the words are embedded in pictures, so Google doesn't see the words, um, and that can be a problem. But you should have no problem, um, search engines should have no problem with Drupal, WordPress, or Joomla, or any of the ones that I mentioned. Um, an interesting question about having your developer do updates in exchange for advertising revenue on your website. Um, I haven't heard of that before, but I don't, uh, I could be wrong, like I just, I mean I haven't heard of a lot of examples, so it's possible that that's another arrangement. Um, I think usually people just pay the developer to do their updates, but obviously you need some kind of, you know, if a barter system works better, then that's, um, that's okay. Um, if it works for you, great, but um, yeah, normally I would, I guess I would expect you to pay for it, but if you can't pay, then I could see that being an option. I mean, if anyone else has experience with that, um, feel free to put in a comment. Um, question about how much technical knowledge is needed for Drupal versus WordPress. Um, I don't have a ton of personal experience setting up the sites from scratch. My impression is that someone with pretty limited technical experience might be able to set up a WordPress site from scratch if they were a little determined and willing to explore and learn a few new things, uh, whereas probably you wouldn't want to set up a Drupal site from scratch. So. Uh, if you were not familiar with the platform. It's just considerably more complex. The way the modules work is kind of confusing if you don't understand programming. Um, so I would definitely recommend getting help with Drupal. So I'm not really sure um, on what scale to put it, but I would say that WordPress, like you can you can get a developer, but it's, it's much, much, much simpler. Um, so if you are on your own, don't go for Drupal, go for, go for WordPress if you can't afford to hire a consultant and are trying to figure this out yourself. I am not a Drupal guru, I do not, I'm sorry, I don't know the details of Drupal 6 versus 7. Um, for those of you who don't know, how Drupal works is that uh, every now and again the developers will be making a bunch of updates and every now and again they'll release a whole new version. So right now Drupal's on version 7, which has significantly different features than Drupal 6, which has significantly different features from Drupal 5. Um, and different modules work, like some modules will only work with Drupal 6, not Drupal 7, etc. So in terms of planning for upgrades, um, you'd really, first of all, you have to make sure that all the, all the modules that you use and want are available in the version you're upgrading to. For example, if you use a module for, again, to go back to the photo gallery example, and your, uh, your photo gallery module is only available in Drupal 6, then you don't want to upgrade to Drupal 7 yet unless you're willing to, um, to put in the time to change the coding yourself or pay for that to be done. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to stay forever on an old version because eventually stuff will start breaking, no one will be supporting it anymore. Um, so this is something where you want to talk to someone who's an expert developer or who's just very familiar with the Drupal platform and also familiar with nonprofits and their needs and they'll be able to give you a better feel for where Drupal's at and when you should think about upgrading. I know Freeform Solutions does a lot of work with Drupal, and I'm sure there are other, um, lots of other consultants out there who would be able to help you with that question. <sighs> Accessibility is a whole other question. Someone asked about that. Um, one big issue for accessibility, I'll come back to again, is a Flash website. Um, if you have a website that's on Flash, it's very difficult for screen readers. It basically just doesn't work, and I actually had that feedback um, Really recently from a friend of mine who's blind, he said just he hates Flash websites because he can't read them at all. So I would stay away from Flash for from an accessibility perspective, even though I know it's really pretty, but it's a pain in the butt. 
for like people who can't read it if they're blind. So that's a problem. Um, there's both things you can do um, when you're developing the site, and there's like little things you can do when you're changing content in terms of like, using alt tags for images, um, etc. It kind of goes into the techie side, but I might be able to find you a good resource on um, on some things you can do to make your website a little bit more accessible. So um, let me follow up with you on that. I love this question. Shouldn't you start by asking whether you need a new website? Any tips for evaluating that? So it's true. Um, you might not need a new website at all. I kind of did this presentation based on the assumption that you know you need a new website. But it's possible that your website that you have is good and all you need to do is maybe give it a new look and feel, um, just do a little revamp. If you already are on a content management system such as WordPress, Joomla, or Drupal, there's probably a lot you can do without totally redoing your site. Um, for example, you'd be amazed um, just by putting a new theme in, it can totally change around your site. So if you think, oh, well, we had the menu bar on the left and now we want it to be along the top and bigger and a few new pages, you don't need to redo your site for that. You just need some basic changes because that's just changing the look and feel. Um, so maybe talk to someone with a little bit of knowledge about your CMS and kind of tell them a bit about the changes you want to make. And they might be able to help you figure out maybe you don't need a whole new website. Maybe you just need some changes to your existing one, in which case you might be able to save a lot of money. Um, on the other hand, if what you want to do, if your website is just sort of date, um, if your website is currently in pure HTML and you want it to be in a content management system, then yes, you're going to need to redo it. Um, and if you have questions about that, if you want to chat with me about whether your website um, is close enough that you could just make some changes or whether you need to do it from scratch, um, just send me an email and I'd be happy to chat about that. I'll just say again, um, I will be sending out an email after this presentation with the audio recording as well as the presentation slides, so that will be available for you, don't worry. Um, so I think it's kind of getting late in the presentation, so, oh sorry, I didn't provide my email contact, let me do that right now. Actually, Lori, can you do that? Um, it is getting late in the presentation, so what I'm going to do, there's a few existing questions that I'd like to address, so I'm just going to follow up with you either personally or if I think it's applicable to everyone, I'll just send in everyone an email answering those questions. Um, I know that the time is sensitive and I want to be respectful of your time, so thank you everyone for attending. If you have any more questions, um, do email me. Lori just put it in the little chat box, so if you open your chat window, you can see it. Um, as I said, I'll be following up with the presentation, the recording, the survey, and, um, and answering any outstanding questions. So thank you very much for attending, and have a rest of your day. I hope it's great. Bye.